Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And I would like really to thank the organizers for their kind invitation. And so my presentation will be a little bit exotic because I'm going to talk to you about different things which are related to the metabolism and endocrinology. But the major part of my topic will focus on the gut microbiota. And if you agree, I will introduce a little bit the recent data showing how the gut microbes may have an effect on the metabolism in host. First of all, the conflict of interest. So we have a contract for the moment with Cargill, but those data will not be presented today. So I have just the same picture as the previous speakers just to talk about this gut microbiota because we don't know finally a lot yet about the composition of the gut microbes inside our gut. But we know much better than 15 years ago because 15 years ago, when we wanted to know which bacteria could be present inside our gut, we had to culture those bacteria. And most of the bacteria are not culturable. From the elucidation of the, the genome of the, and the sequencing and the genome of the microbiome, now things have changed because we have now in hand very new techniques based on molecular biology just to approach this new world. And so what we can say that finally it is impressive, this gut microbiota, because those microbes for sure are numerous. So if we take into account the red blood cells, we have more or less the same number of bacterial cells inside our gut than the number of cells in our own body. And for sure, this system, this ecosystem is really dynamics. So there are a lot of genes which are expressed by the microbes, by the bacteria, that we do not express in our own genome. I also represent the gut microbiota with this genus uh, gut because finally, when we have a look to what is the gut microbiota and what does it do, do for the host metabolism, so we can see that there are some very interesting functions which are played by these gut microbes. For example, the well-known synthesis of vitamins or the education of the immune systems uh, in the infants, for example, but we also have inside our gut some potentially harmful component. And I will talk to you a little bit about the role of the lipopolysaccharides, or LPS, which are the major membrane components of the gram-negative bacteria. We have one gram of LPS inside our gut, and we have to keep it at bay. Because if it enters the blood, for example, for sure, it will create problems, and we will see even at very low dose, it will improve, uh, it will change the metabolism of the host. So the gut barrier function is crucial, and I will show you that most of the cell types which are present inside the gut may play a role in this gut barrier and in the control of host metabolism. So one thing which is known and studied for a few years now, it is to try to characterize the composition and the activity of the gut microbiota in patients who suffer from different pathologies. And here, I will talk to you about, for example, the changes in the gut microbiota occurring in obese or type 2 diabetic patients. And those changes are characterized as dysbiosis because it correlates to the changes in the host physiology. And so we can represent once again the gut microbiome by taking the pig, uh, picture uh, of a Belgian painter, Jim Sansor, because it's very important to represent that we need to keep inside our gut microbes the diversity. And it has been shown that the bacterial diversity is lower in obese individuals who are much more prone to develop diabetes or insulin resistance, for example. We can also see that there are in the obese patients and diabetic patients a drop of very interesting bacteria. Like, for example, some of them, you know them, that's bifidobacteria that are some educators of the immune system. Fecalibacterium prosnitsi, which is really an anti-inflammatory bacteria playing a key role in the uh, gut diseases, but also shown as dropped in obesity. 
And some bacteria which are butyrate producers, meaning that when they are present, those bacteria, when they use some substrate, they produce short-chain fatty acids like butyrate, which plays a crucial role for the intestinal uh, ecosystem. And finally, I will come back with you to one bacteria, which is called the Ackermansia mucinifila, which, as you will see, plays a crucial role in the gut barrier. So all those potentially beneficial bacteria are dropped in the patients developing the metabolic disease. And on the other hand, there are for sure some other bacteria which are more potentially pathogens, called pathobions, which can increase in the same situation. And so, if you agree, what I propose is first just to uh, make an overview of the relationship between the changes in the gut microbiota present in obesity and metabolic disorders, to try to know by which molecular mechanism could the microbes play a role on host physiology. And thereafter, I will come uh, to the presence and to the interest of certain type of nutrients and nutritional approach to try to modulate these dysbiosis. So Patrice Cani in our lab has been working a long, a long time uh, on the role of the gut barrier in the installation of the metabolic disorders occurring in obesity by using first animal models of obesity, genetic obesity or high fat diet induced obesity. And to make a long story short, what he could see is that when there are some high fat diet fed animals and when they develop the metabolic disease, there are disruption of many mechanisms which are involved in the gut barrier function. For example, changes in the tight junction, expression and localization, but also the activation of certain systems like the endocannabinoid systems inside the gut or inflammation occurring in the intestinal tissue itself. And one of the consequences, it is the translocation of the lipopolysaccharides inside the blood, which in increases only uh, twofold, but it is sufficient to create inflammation and metabolic disorders at distance, like in the adipose tissue, in the muscle, but also in the liver. A recent paper has shown that not all fatty acids play this role of disturbances of the gut barrier. And this is an elegant study performed by the group of Frederick Backett, showing that when you give a high fat diet, which is mostly rich in saturated fat, so you create for sure obesity and metabolic disease, and you also have some changes in the gut microbes in favor of some bacteria like Bilophila or Bacteroides, which promote the translocation of LPS. If you give the same amount of the uh, high fat, but by, by giving mostly the omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids with the fish, for example, then you have a completely different changes in the gut microbes. You have an increase of the bacteria I have mentioned before, the acromancia involved in the gut barrier, but also certain types of lactobacilli and bifidobacterium. And more interestingly, when you take the microbes coming from these mice which were fed with the omega-3 polyunsaturated fat diet, then and you, trans and you transfer these microbiota in the germ-free mice and you give them a high-fat diet, they are protected against the development of the metabolic diseases, partly at least. So it means that the changes that you can just print inside the gut microbes may per se play a role in the development of the disease. So in the lab, we have also shown that when you have the translocation of LPS, LPS may also play a role in the disturbances of the gut barrier by playing a role and by changing the metabolism in the intestine. When the LPS is binding to its receptors, which are the toll-like receptor 4, so they can activate different pathways, including the mid-88 pathway, creating pro-inflammatory process. And so we have used a model of inducible cell-specific deletion of mid-88 in the intestinal cells to try to know if the presence of LPS, but more coherently, the activation of those receptors in the intestine play a role in obesity. 
And in a nutshell, what we could see, it is that when you give a high fat diet to mice, for sure, as expected, you create obesity, you have an increase in the fat mass, but also steatosis, accumulation of lipids in the liver tissue, and also the increase of LPS, I have mentioned before, and this leads to disturbances of the glucose homeostasis. When you have in front of you, and during the treatment, some mice which have been killed in the intestine for the mid-88, you improve the situation, meaning that you have less development of fat mass and you also have an improvement of the steatosis and of the endotoxemia. And once again, interestingly, when you take the gut microbiota from the mid-88 knockout mice for the intestine and you transfer uh, in the germ-free mice, you can also protect them against obesity. Then it means that you have some effects occurring in the, in the gut itself that may play a role. How can we recapitulate the role of certain bacteria in this context? I say that finally we have hundreds of billions of bacteria and a lot of bacterial networks inside the gut. How can we point out some bacteria which could be interesting? I will just show you one example. It is the example of the Ackermansia mucinifila. In fact, it is a gram-negative bacteria, then it contains LPS. But it plays a crucial role in the gut barrier because it is just stimulating the goblet cells to produce the mucus. It is really a stimulator of the mucus by the goblet cells. And here we have shown briefly that when you give a high-fat diet to, to the mice, so you decrease the mucus thickness and you also decrease the Ackermansia mucinifila, but when you treat the mice with viable Ackermansia mucinifila, then you restore the mucus thickness and you improve endotoxemia and systemic inflammation. Then it means that one specific bacteria, because it plays a crucial role on the gut barrier, may be interesting in the context of metabolic disease. And there is now one study uh, that started in, in Belgium and in the Netherlands to try to test this hypothesis in the uh, obese individuals. That's a study which is called the microbes, and it is visible on internet. Then it is the, micro, the probiotic approach. So when you give a, a bacteria because you think that there is something to change and to do with this bacteria, it is called the probiotics, the probiotic approach. By analogy, it is also possible just to have actions on the gut ecosystem by feeding the microbiota, meaning that you are going to give some nutrients which are going to, 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 favor, to, to, to favor the development of certain bacteria. Then I will show you briefly what we can do with this prebiotic approach. Can we feed the bacteria in a good way? It is the prebiotics. So it is a concept that was born not so long ago. It was in, in the 95, in fact, where some components that were first extracted from the shikari root, but that you find in many foodstuffs and vegetables like the cereals, uh, onions, garlic, leek, and so on, those are the inulin, which are uh, polymers and oligomers of fructose. And the characteristic of this molecule is that they are resistant to the digestion in the upper part of the gut. But there are some bacteria that express the beta fructosidase and which are able to use these fructans as energy substrate and then to gain a proliferative advantage on the other bacteria. It is the case, for example, of the bifidobacteria. And then when you feed this type of compound to animals, but also in humans, it has been shown in different contexts, you can promote the bifidobacteria. But what we could see in the animal models of obesity, once again here the high fat diet model, we could see that more than 100 microbial genes were modified by treating the animals with the prebiotics, which was the inulin type fructans, uh, at the same time as the high fat diet treatment. And so it means that you can profoundly change the gut microbiome by giving some substrates which at the beginning, only touch, only modify certain types of bacteria, here the bifidobacteria. 
And then it's very difficult to try to know what happens. There are some teams now who are spending time to try to recapitulate the networks and the dialogue established between the different types of bacteria. And for sure, those networks appear. Some bacteria may use some lactate produced by the bifidobacteria and then produce other substrate that can stimulate the other bacteria. So those networks exist. But one thing which is very interesting for the moment, it is the fact that when you change the gut microbiota, you can also attribute this effect to the promotion of the expression in the intestine of some antimicrobial peptides. Here, there is a huge increase of REC3 gamma, and when this peptide, this gene is expressed, the protein is able to modulate, to modify profoundly the gut microbiota. So it is just a, a thing happening when you feed the gut microbiota with specific nutrients, you can also print some change in the host intestinal tissue that in its turn will have consequences on the gut microbes. One thing which is quite important to mention is that in fact there are a lot of functions and cells which are modified by this prebiotic approach. I've shown you the production of antimicrobial peptides. There are also some promotion of uh, peptides involved in intestinal cell renewal, but also increase, for example, of the expression of the tight junction proteins. And the consequence is that with the prebiotic approach, here once again the inulin type fructan, you can also improve the decrease, the LPS level, so you have the decrease of the LPS level, and you can improve also the host metabolism and inflammation at distance of the gut, decrease insulin resistance, hepatic inflammation, and adipose tissue inflammation. And it means that the gut cells play a primary role in the effects. And one thing also to mention is that there are some types of, types of cells which at the beginning could not be directly linked to the gut microbes. And it is the case of the endocrine cells present in the colon, and I will show you the data about the L cells. So you are all aware here in this society that uh, the L cells produce for sure some peptides like glucagon-like peptide 1 or glucagon-like peptide 2, which play a crucial role in host metabolism. What we could see here, it is in OBOB mice, it is the fact that the changes in the gut microbiota and once again the increase of Ackermansia correlates with an increase of the number of L cells which are present in the colon. And we could see that there were a promotion of the differentiation of the L cells in the colon. And the consequence, it is an increase of the endogenous level of the GLP-1 here in the portal vein, but also GLP-2. And by using some knockout models and antagonists, we could see that it participates for GLP-1 to the improvement of society or glycemia. And concerning the GLP-2, it plays also a crucial role in the maintenance of the intestinal barrier and the decrease of endotoxemia. Then there are also other mechanisms that can be uh, shown in the literature. So we, we made an overview of those mechanisms because I just showed you that the prebiotic approach allowed to promote the differentiation of L cells. We don't know the mechanism by which it may occur. We are now studying this type of mechanism uh, using namely the organoids model. But there are also some metabolites which are produced in the gut which play a role in the control of those L cells. And I won't, play, won't spend too much time on that, but for example, these short chain fatty acids produced upon the fermentation of the complex carbohydrates, like inulin, for example, but other fibers also, may bind to specific receptors to the L cells and thereby stimulate the secretion of the endocrine peptides. There are also, for sure, the bile acids, which play a crucial role in the L cells function, many data are coming out for the moment, and we are now studying how the complex carbohydrates or prebiotics may play a role on the bile acid homeostasis and how it participates to this modulation of the gut endocrine function. I will show you, just to end this part describing the effect of prebiotics, that we do not necessarily expect to have all the effect attributed to the prebiotic approach only in the context of obesity. 
So you know that for sure obesity it is due to an excess of, of energy and fat intake and a decrease in energy expenditure, but there are also a lot of nutritional disequilibrium which are characterizing the obese individuals. And so we were particularly interested by the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And to make a long story short, so knowing that the decrease of and uh, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids was observed in the liver tissue of steatohepatitis patients. So we wanted just to create an experimental model of omega-3 polyunsaturated deficiency. It was quite simple, finally, so we replaced uh, the soybean by the sunflower, and so we treated mice for quite a long time, and so we could recapitulate the metabolic alterations, namely the occurrence of steatosis, but also changes in the vascular function in the gut of the mice treated with the omega-3 deficient diet. Without creating inflammation, without creating obesity. It's quite a pure metabolic uh, alteration. And recently, that's unpublished data, so we have, we have performed an experiment in omega-3 depleted mice, and we tested uh, these omega-3 depleted diets uh, in two types of mice, the wild-type mice, but also the APOEKO mice, which are prone to develop uh, cardiovascular disease and vascular dysfunction for three months. And we only treated part of those mice during the last 15 days of the treatment with the prebiotics. We isolated the arteries coming from the mesentera, so the mesenteric arteries, and we mounted those arteries on a myograph just to analyze the potency of relaxation or contraction with different agonists and antagonists. So it was an ex vivo model that was applied. And we were really surprised to see that even 15 days of prebiotic approach was able just to restore the vascular dysfunction. On this graph, you have the residual contraction to the KCL, and so you see here in black that the cow deficient mice have really disturbances of the uh, endothelial function, and it is completely restored and blunted in mice treated with the prebiotics. We could attribute this improvement to the production of NO, which is a very important vasorelaxant. And so you, could, you can see here that in the KO mice treated with the omega-3 deficient diet, there is a decrease in the NO circulating NO, and you have the restoration by the prebiotic treatment, and you have also the restoration of the artery sickness. There are, once again, in this model, profound changes of the gut microbes. And what we have to do now is to try to know which bacterial metabolites or which bacteria which are promoted in the prebiotic treated group are able just to modulate the endothelial function. And so that's our job for the moment. And we can once again point out that the decrease of acromancia occurring in the model where there is a vascular dysfunction is also restored by the prebiotics, but we don't know for sure if some metabolites or peptides produced by acromancia could play a role in the regulation of the vascular function. In this model, once again, we could see that there was an increase of the GLP-1, and in view of in vitro data showing how GLP-1 agonist may play a role in the improvement of vascular dysfunction, we can think that maybe once again, the endocrine function of the gut, which is boosted in this situation, may be implicated in the improvement of host metabolism and health. I will end my presentation by asking a key question because we can go further in all the mechanisms and so on, so if it is not relevant for human health, it doesn't mean anything. And so I will disappoint you because since the story of the prebiotics is quite new, there are not so numerous studies published until now. So uh, we have shown that when you give the prebiotics the same as the one described before, the inulin type fructan to, uh, uh, to healthy volunteers, you can in fact, when you give them a breakfast which is rich in carbohydrates, 
improve the glycemia, and you can also see an increase of the postprandial GLP-1, which appears in the persons which were, who were treated with the prebiotics as compared to the placebo. And it is a proof of concept that even if the quantity of these fiber prebiotic is much different in animals and humans, sometimes some metabolic stigmates may be also stimulated in these situations. We could also see that there are some changes of the microbes which are similar in mice and in humans, here it is in a, an, a, an intervention study in obese individuals, and what we could see, it is just like in mice, not all the bifidobacteria, for example, are taken advantage of the proliferation due to the prebiotic approach. We could see a small increase of Ackermansia, but interestingly, some of the change of the microbes were clearly correlated with the improvement of endotoxemia and a decrease in fat mass. But the effect, for sure, are really minor, and now what we try to do is to try just to make a choice in the type of patients that suffer from these biosis associated to inflammation, which, in our view, will be the most responsive one and the one who need this type of treatment. Then there are only few intervention studies, as I mentioned. You can see here the doses that were given every day and, and the duration of the treatments, not so much. It is always the number of patients which remains quite low in this intervention study. But for example, the effect on glycemia of the dietary fructans has been approved by the European Food Safety Agency, and there are also several papers showing the effect on endocrine functions. Uh, we have recently just launched one project that has as an objective just to increase the number of obese patients in which this prebiotic approach will be done. And more particularly, what we would like to do and what we have started to do, it is not only to give an isolated compound, but it is in fact to change the diet of the obese individuals in the treated group for sure in favor of the vegetables which are quite rich in inulin and and fermentable fibers to see if those changes are preeminent. There are some data published in China with the Chinese food, which are very, very encouraging and published in very good journals showing the efficacy of this type of treatment. Take home message, finally. So I hope that I have convinced you that the diet has an influence on the gut microbes, and so there are some non-digestible carbohydrates which are particularly uh, able to change the composition, but also the activity of the gut microbiota with consequence on the host health. The mechanistic studies pointed out the modulation of the gut endocrine function as being very important, but also changes in the gut barrier function, even if this type of effect is very difficult to evaluate in humans. Adequate intervention studies are really required and needed just to try to know if the innovative approach, not only nutrients, but also, for example, fecal transfer, will have one day something to play in the treatment or management of the host health. And in that sense, so there is now a European consortium working together in order to better understand with adequate human intervention studies and mechanistic studies how the changes in the gut microbiota by food, probiotics, but also gut transfer may have an effect on the host metabolism, mostly in the context of obesity. It is a my new gut project if you are interested in. And I would like to thank you for your attention and all the people who are working very hard in the lab since I am here. They are working a lot. Without them, I'm nothing. And also all, all our collaborators. Thank you very much.